In video number 7 I introduced my simple LogConnect Wi-Fi throttle that I put together using just some standard components. In this video I am going to explain some of the inner workings, in particular the cooperation between the touch display and the LogConnect functions implemented in the ESP8266. And to get started I will show you some additional functionality I have implemented in the meantime. Hello YouTubers and welcome to the Internet of Toy Trains. I am Hans Tanner and here is a new episode of IOTT with fresh ideas about how to use the Internet of Things along with sensors and microcontrollers to control a model railroad layout. So get on board, the train is leaving the station. Just a day or two after publishing video number 7, I received a package from Banggood with two of the next larger size of the next gen display. 3.5 inch instead of 3.2 and a resolution of 480 x 320 instead of 400 x 240. Of course I had to change my throttle to the larger display and I must say it makes quite a difference. And as I was working on it anyway, I added some more functionality. Here's a quick demonstration. The first thing is the immediate speed step function. As with the brake and the direction buttons, the speed knob now also reacts to a touch which is longer than 500 milliseconds with instantly setting the current speed to the touch value instead of sending it to the timer based adjustment. This is useful to go to a particular speed immediately and also it makes the functionality consistent with the other buttons. And thanks to the higher resolution of the larger display, I now have 19 instead of 14 touch points along the rim of the knob. Second, I added dispatch get to the dispatch button. If a locomotive is assigned to the throttle, pressing the disc button will put it to the dispatch buffer. And without a locomotive assigned, the throttle will try to get one from the dispatch buffer of the command station. The button label changes accordingly. Third, I added the consist management screen. It can be opened by long pressing the address button if a locomotive is assigned to the throttle. In this case a new screen opens that shows the consist structure and gives you convenient access to function F0 to F4 of each locomotive in the consist. I think this is much more comfortable than managing consists on a DT throttle which I always found somewhat cumbersome. I am also working on a functionality that allows for adding and removing locomotives but this is not finished yet. Fourth, I made use of the larger display and changed the switchboard from 9 to 16 switch activators. This caused some problems in the software as we will talk about later in this video. And finally, I made some cosmetic changes to the layout to make sure the look and feel is about the same on every page of the display. That's it for the moment. Let's now talk about the software in more detail. First, the next gen display. If you watched video 7, you know that the display has its own processor to display the graphical elements and monitor input from the touchscreen. It then communicates to the microcontroller using a serial communication line at 9600 baud. The controller then processes the received commands and replies accordingly, asking to show another page or whatever is needed. Programming the display is relatively simple as the manufacturer provides a Windows-based simulator. So the entire user interface can be developed and tested on the PC and then loaded into the display using a micro SD card. You can download the simulator from the link in the description section below. You can also download the display sources for the throttle from my GitHub page. There's a link below as well. The user interface of the throttle as you have seen has several pages, which are individually built in the simulator. As an example, let me show you how to create the switchboard page. The other pages are basically the same. The first step is to create a new graphical user interface file and select the device type we are using. In my case, this is the 3.5 inch advanced display. An empty display simulator will appear on the screen. Next, we have to design the graphical elements for the page. In the case of the switchboard, we need a background bitmap and bitmaps for the activator buttons of the switches. Here, 
We need two, one for the left side position and one for the right side position. I use a simple bitmap editor to create those bitmaps. The address labels and buttons can be created using the built-in dialog elements, so no more bitmaps needed. When done, we need to import the bitmaps into the simulator. Click the plus button in the picture pane and import the three bitmaps. Now we are ready to design the display page. Picking and placing components is the same for all component types. You can pick them from the toolbox and move them around on the simulated display. Also, the attributes dialog on the right side lets you change the component attributes like size, position, colors and other values depending on the component. First, I place a picture for the background and assign the background image to it. Note that the resolution of bitmap and display must be identical. The next one is not capable to stretch or shrink an image. Then I create 16 more pictures for the activator buttons. As default option, I assign the left position bitmap to them. On top of each picture, I place a numeric label for the switch number and number them from 1 to 16. Of course, we will later replace those numbers based on the addresses to be displayed. In the top row, I add the plus, minus and address buttons as well as an X button to close the display page and return to throttle mode. And in the bottom row, I place the buttons for acceleration, deceleration, braking and direction change. To see how it looks like in the real display, I can open the simulator. Here we see all the buttons and switch activators displayed as intended. However, when I click on any of the symbols, there is no action. So let's close the simulator and add some functionality. To let the microcontroller know that the visual element has been clicked, we simply tell the respective event to send the component ID. There are two events, the click event and the release event. In the case of the address and speed buttons, it is sufficient to use one of them. I normally use the press event. For the switch activator buttons, we need both events as we want to send a switch activation message to Loconet in the moment the button is pressed, as well as a deactivation message when the button is released. With those events, the microcontroller now gets all information about what's happening on the display side. The controller can then react and send commands back to the display, for example to replace the left pointing activator bitmap with the one pointing to the right, once the switch position has changed. Or send a new switch address for display to each of the labels. While this would work, it would lead to a very sluggish display. To change the text in the label, we would send a command like and 0.well equals 20 and repeat it for all 16 labels with just increasing the switch number parameter. That would be a total of about 200 bytes or about 0.2 seconds just for the transmission. On top of this the display would do a screen refresh after each command. So we would see the screen flickering for about half a second and the controller would be pretty much unavailable for other things and spend lots of time waiting for the display to become ready to receive the next command. So, how can we do better? Well, when designing the display, there is one basic principle I recommend to follow and that is to minimize communication to the microcontroller as much as possible. Serial communication at 9600 baud is slow, so it is best to try to avoid it. And luckily, the display can execute a lot of things on its own, without ongoing interaction. Let me demonstrate this using the example of updating the labels. Here the rule is that all labels show consecutive numbers. Therefore, it is enough for the display to know the first address. I call it base address and I define a variable named VA base adder. In addition, I define another variable VA old base adder. Now the controller can write a new base number into VA base adder and if this is compared to the old value in VA old base adder, the display knows that the base address has changed and the labels need to be updated. 
This can be done using a timer that is called frequently and updates the display. So I define a timer TM0 and set it to 100 milliseconds. In the timer routine I check the value of VA base error and if it is different than before I change the 16 labels to a new value. Let's check in the simulator how it works. I start the simulator, go to the switchboard page and enter a new base address. For example, va0.val equals 15. And immediately we can see that all 16 labels are changed. Nice! That is simple and takes a lot of communication away from the microcontroller so the display becomes much faster. The same principle also works for the activator buttons. Here I send the value of all 16 buttons as a 4 byte long integer number to the display variable VASVSTAT. I use 2 bits for each switch, so the position is represented by the odd bits of each byte, resulting in 4 times 4 equals 16 bits, or 1 bit for each switch. In the timer routine I then filter out the current position for each switch and update the bitmap. Simple and effective, again very low workload for the controller. The same principle is also used for the direction switches. Check it out for yourself and you will see the same method in every page of the display. Now let's have a look at the other end, the microcontroller. I usually use the Arduino IDE to program the ESP8266 in C, C++ as I found this flexible and convenient. Also, there are plenty of libraries available which makes programming faster and easier. If you go through the code, you see several elements that I already used in the MQTT gateway, for example the web server component, so I am not going to explain those. What I would like to have a closer look at, however, is how to handle the communication with the display. For the Nextgen display, I chose to use the Neo Nextgen library. This library has been written by a user, but it is based on the official Arduino Nextgen library supplied by ITIAT, the Nextgen manufacturer. The main reason I chose it is that it is downloadable from within the Arduino IDE. And at the time when I installed it, I was not even aware that there is an official library. Plus, ever since, I never had a reason to change the official version. No surprise, dealing with the display makes for the highest number of lines of code in my throttle sketch. First of all, we have to define a display element for every component we want to communicate with directly. In the example of the switchboard, that would be all buttons and activator bitmaps. No need to define the labels as the update of those is handled by the display as we have seen before. I could also define the variables the same way and then use the variable set value function to update it. However, I chose not to do that and instead send new values using the next.send command function with variable name and value as parameters. From a communication point of view, it generates the same number of bytes but with fewer code lines in the program. To drive the display, I added the next.pull command to the loop function of my sketch. What it does is checking the serial port for new messages from the display. If one is received, it then figures out from what display component it comes and calls the callback function of the component if one is defined. So for every event we define a callback function and assign it to the component. Now we get information sorted out for each component and it is very straightforward to write an event handler for it. Here is the example event handler for the switch activator buttons. Because the structure is the same for each activator button, we can use the same callback function for all of them, which saves a lot of copy and paste. Let's look what it does. In the first part, we just figure out what switch activator is calling. This goes by the component ID. You may wonder why the component IDs are so different. Unfortunately, component IDs are assigned automatically when the component is created in the simulator and they cannot be changed later. If you watched video number 7, you probably remember that for the smaller display I only had 9 activator switches. At that point in time, 
all the IDs were just consecutive. But after switching to the larger display, I decided to go to 16 activators, so I added one row and one column, a total of 7 more switches, which also have consecutive numbers, but some numbers missing in between. So, for this reason, I now can't use a convenient formula to convert the IDs into switch addresses, but have to use the switch case statement as shown. In the next step, I simply add the base address to the address of the activator switch, and this is already the DCC address of the switch we want to control, with an offset of 1, as DCC addresses start with 0. Next, I call the getPictureID function to find out whether the switch position is left or right. Note that this causes an active communication to the display, consumes some time to do, but cannot be avoided because information is not part of the event code. To me, a weakness of the NextGen display, but anyway. Now that I know the position, I send the switch command to Loconet via MQTT with position information and activation status, which is on for press events and off for release events. If you scroll through the code, you will see that the same structure is used for all event handlers, so you should be able to understand what's going on. As always, the complete code can be downloaded from the GitHub page referenced below in the description section. I'm sorry, this was a bit technical, but I hope you found it interesting. And if not, I assume you stopped watching after the introduction part anyway. Let's summarize. The NextGen display allows for complete separation of codes for the graphical user interface and the application. It is almost like writing two small programs instead of one big, which reduces the complexity of the task and makes debugging easier. The main thing on the display side is to do as much as possible just in the display, for example consecutive operations, and to eliminate communication with the controller as much as possible. When doing so, the display feels much more responsive to user input. A good way to reduce communication from the controller to the display is using some variables that combine data input for several components in just one data element. The display then decomposes them and updates the components internally, for example by using a timer function. On the controller side, it is a good idea to work with callback functions, as this keeps each function pretty small and simple, helps with debugging and understanding the code. The 3.5 inch display, with its higher resolution of 320 by 480 pixels, is a real step forward compared to the only slightly smaller 3.2 version, which only offers 240 by 400 pixels. It definitely is worth the few extra bucks. All in all, I think this display has a lot of potential for implementing comfortable and upgradable graphical user interfaces in small devices at very reasonable cost and I am pretty sure I will use it in some future projects as well. Okay, that's it for today. Feel free to download the codes for microcontroller and display from my GitHub page. Install the simulator on your computer and start playing with it. Who knows, maybe you end up building your own throttle, but please let me know if you come up with some slick ideas how to further improve the user experience. As promised earlier, the next video will be more hardware related, at least somewhat. So stay tuned, subscribe to the IOTT channel and click the like button if you liked this video. Thanks for watching and see you soon.